The message today is called In Search of Abishag. You say, who is Abishag? Well, let me introduce you to her in one of the strangest verses in the Bible. Boy, you came on a good day. 1 Kings chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, it says, When King David was very old, he could not keep warm, even when they put covers over him. So his attendants said to him, Let us look for a young virgin to serve the king and take care of him. She can lie beside him so that our Lord the king may keep warm. Then they searched throughout Israel for a beautiful young woman and found Abishag the Shunammite and brought her. To the king. Beloved, God is working in our world right now. You say, Craig, I see chaos. I see confusion. I hear multi voices. I, I, I don't know what's real and, and what to trust and what to believe. This is what's real. The sovereign God of heaven and earth is searching the earth right now and he's bringing forth his Abishags. Now, we're not just going to talk about young ladies today. So we'll talk about Abishag and Shaggy. There, you guys. You can be raggy, shaggy. Yeah. That's what we do. Yeah, right. So we've got our Abishags, you ladies, that have been prepared your whole life for this hour. And we have our Shaggies. All right. So there we go. We've leveled all the stress now. What do the names Shifra and Pua have in common with the name Abishag. Shifra and Pua were the midwives mentioned in Exodus chapter 2. Do you remember the story of Moses going way back? His mommy was pregnant with him, and there was a prophecy that in the fourth generation, a prophet would arise, and Pharaoh ordered all the young men killed. The spirit of Pharaoh is always seeking to destroy the prophetic voice and stop the work of God. And so we see Pharaoh gave an edict. If any of the, the, the Hebrew women give birth to boys, kill them. Girls, let them live. And Shifra and Pua were the two midwives in charge of the birthing stools. And so guess what? They lied to Pharaoh and said, yeah, all the boys are dead. Or they said, gosh, these Hebrew women are so robust. I mean, they give birth to a kid before we come in and we don't see the boys. They protected Moses. And I want you to see what a midwife is. A midwife is a person who can be trusted at the most intimate experiential moment of birth. From womb to tomb today, we're going to see. Midwives, you don't know that you're a midwife. But did you know that God trusts you in intimate moments with other people? Did you know God had to trust a midwife? Did you know mamas were the most vulnerable at the moment of birth? Did you know that the only people allowed in the holy birthing room were godly midwives? Because from beginning of life to end of life, we're going to look at from womb to tomb, from supervising birth to dealing with hospice care at the end of life, Birth, womb and tomb are the most intimate moments of tender yieldedness. Midwives were trusted with the life of the child and the mother. And did you know God has been making you all your life into a midwife that other people can trust? Mm -hmm. That's the process you've been going through. Yes, it hurts. Yes, it's painful. Yes, it's difficult. And we'll find out today. In order to be everything the king wants us to be, we're going to have to surrender some things in order to be exactly what he wants us to be. I don't know about you, but I want to be everything the king wants me to be in the moment. I want to be the servant in the room that will go anywhere, do anything at any time, in any context that he would request. No limits. I want to be available as an instrument in his hand, a surgical instrument that can be usable to him in any context. So midwives with Shipper and Pua, we see at the beginning of life, the sacred moment of birth is such a secret, sacred place that has to be guarded from bacteria and guarded from, from any intrusion that would soil life. And as it comes forth, but we're going to look at Abishag today. Abishag is going to represent a young woman who is in charge of the 
ADLs, all the activities of daily life as David is an old man just about to die. He has a year to live. He's lived a long life as the greatest king God has ever set on a throne. But we see David in 1 Kings 1, 1 through 3. At the, he's on his last leg. He is, he is, he is, he is, he, is, he can't get warm. The fire won't make him warm. The clothes that they're putting on won't make him warm. And so according to custom, they say, we need to find a young woman who will stand before the king, cherish the king, adore the king, and take care of the king. And they set an all-out beauty search for Miss Israel. They said, now this is nothing perverse. This is nothing strange. In fact, the text says David knew her not. He didn't have any sexual relationship with her. I want you to see as we speak the name of Abishag today, and her name is a little weird. I know that. Her name means father of wandering or my father wanders. It has a hint of dubious parentage. I don't know about you, but you may have come from a weird family of origin. All right. Your dad may have been strange, or your mom may have been strange, or you may have just been raised uh, with less than what you needed, but it doesn't matter because Abishag, we're going to find out, is perfectly anointed to minister to David at the most vulnerable point of his life. Did you know you're most vulnerable as you're being born, and you're most vulnerable next when you're about to die? And did you know that God is drawing forward out of hibernation, out of hiding, all of his shaggies and abishags, his midwives that he trusts with newness of life, and his end of care hospice workers like Abishag that care about you. You've never been more vulnerable than when you're coming out of your mother's womb and never more vulnerable than just before you step into eternity. Have you ever thought about that? Maybe you're not too experienced in the NICU unit. Well, I've seen many children born, and I've been present at C-sections and VBAC births, and I've been in that holy place in that room, and I've heard language I never thought I'd ever hear from godly women. Because that is a messy place, and that is a loud place, and that is a place of pain when you're in the birth birthing room. But it's also very disturbing at times at the end of life in hospice care when you are in one of those old folks homes that you don't want to go to where people have bed sores and one nurse takes care of five people and it might be your mother and it might be a loved one and they get bed sores and the urine stinks and they got to change diapers all the time and they have to put you on egg crate care and then they have to move you every 20 minutes from side to side and if you get one of those little nurses angry because she's not paid too much money to drag your mom in and out of that bed if you're rude to them, not a wise thing because they'll just ignore your button. So you see how important safety is in the womb to the tomb. And we're going to introduce you to Abishag because God put a national beauty contest out, but it was, they were looking for Miss Israel. They were looking for a supermodel, but look, a supermodel with character. And you know, the Bible says that they had to look high and low for her. She was to be fair. She was to be lovely. And her job was to cherish the king. Now, I'm sure in Jerusalem that there were a lot of lovely women. But they have to go all over the coast. They have to, what would equal 30 miles of walking is where they find Abishai. She wasn't at hand. She wasn't a normal believer. There were a lot of pretty women around Jerusalem, and I'm sure there were a lot of pretty women that were really had sparkly personalities, and I'm sure there were, but they had to look all over the land to find this young woman who was a combination of beauty and character and internal loveliness who would love David in an I thou intimacy. Who would treat David as an end in and of himself, not as a means to an end. Did you know if you know David's story, you know there were a lot of women in David's life. He has multiple wives that could have functioned as bed warmers, but none of them come in into the story. Because God had chosen one young lady 
named Abishag, who was a surrendered life that could be trusted at the most intimate moment. Do you know when you're about to die, you're on the cusp of eternity. You're reviewing the value of your life. As a hospice worker, you hear confessions of sin that no one has ever heard because someone's getting ready for eternity. People tell the truth when they know they're going to die. They have nothing to lose. So you can see David is the king, and he is most vulnerable. But does his immediate entourage fit the bill to care for him and cherish him and to wipe his butt and help him go to the table to eat and help change his clothes and lay all night with him to warm him up? Abishag, there she is. The Bible says they looked all over Israel, and she was found in Shunem. Shunem was the lower region of Galilee, in the footholds of the mountains of Lebanon, in the tribe of Issachar. And in this place, David and Solomon had huge estates of vineyards and spice gardens and fruit orchards and vast herds of sheep grazing. And, and what David and Solomon would do is that they would, they would let out this land as estates, and people would come on and care for all of the king's property. And then you were able to move families in that would take care of all of these things. And Abishag was the daughter of one of these estate owners down there. Shunem, by the way, you might remember the Shunammite. That was the name of Solomon's beloved in the Song of Songs. The first wife he had, the one he was desperately in love with before he added all the others and got into trouble. He had 700 wives and 300 porcupines, uh, concubines. That's a lot of pantyhose and a lot of mother-in-law and a lot of trouble. But Solomon's first is called the Shunammite. And did you know, just for your information, that many scholars believe that Abishag was the Shunammite in Song of Songs, the love of Solomon's life. We'll just put that bookmark there and comment more next week on that. Who is Abishag? She's a young woman who has been asked, would you serve the king? In order to say yes, she is going to have to surrender a number of things. Theologian Brian McBrad has some interesting insights. Uh, I'm going to take a few leaves out of his work and add to them. As we look at Abishag, we see that to find her, they had to go 30 hours away. But I want you to notice she is called forward with a destiny to be in the king's palace. And beloved, you have to look at David's life. He's an old, cold, frail king, and he needs someone to cuddle, to keep him warm. But that someone is going to be on 24-hour care. She is going to stand in the king's presence. That means a servant of the king. She is going to cherish the king and adore the king. She is going to meet every need the king has. Now, I've got a little handicapped boy named Michael, and I know exactly what's involved in meeting all of his needs. I'm a shaggy when it comes to Michael. I stand in his presence day and night. I change his pee. I wipe his butt. I put him in the shower. I feed him. I give him water to drink. Every two hours, he gets his tummy drinks for his choleric intake. And Michael is utterly cared for and cherished by daddy and by Rebecca, and by Vicky, and by all of his beloved caretakers. Even Dennis sometimes will mess with him. And Dennis has to remember to put that child lock on his truck door because Michael loves to open the door mid-flight. But you see, I stand in Michael's presence. I serve him, I honor him, I cherish him, I adore him, and I meet every need the boy has. Now, I want you to see something about Abishag. She's not just hired help. 
to say yes, to be everything the king needs her to be, she's going to have to surrender some things. First of all, it says that she was a young virgin. That means that she was still living in with her family. For her to leave Shunem and go to the king's palace, she's going to have to leave behind everyone she's known that is precious in her life. Did you know sometimes in our walk with the Lord, family often can be a tool of the enemy to keep us from walking with the Lord. Have you ever had issues in your family? I, when I first got saved, my parents were glad I got religion, but they didn't like me write, writing in my Bible. I started underlining the Sermon on the Mount in Grandpa's Bible, and they, did, they, they wanted me to get religion, but not too much. I was getting a little crazy. I was going a little over the top. Ever had issues in your family where they might be the ones putting the actual brakes on in your capacity to serve the king because they just don't understand? Well, there's nothing new under the sun, beloved. Abishag had to choose the king over her family relationships. Ever had to do that? It's not being rude to them. It's just simply saying, I have a choice and I need to surrender my family obligations in order to be all the king needs to be. Next, she surrendered her freedom. She was a young woman. She had a whole life, no doubt, before her, probably had some dreams, probably had some vague ideas about what she'd like to be, or maybe there were some young men that were suitors that were showing interest in her. If she says yes to being all the king needs her to be, she needs to surrender the allegiance she has to her family and her own freedom. Because if she takes up the yoke of service to the king, she is limiting her freedom. Did you know walking with God is a constant narrowing of the lane of your life? You know, there are just less things you're able to do. It's not legalism. It's just, if I walk with Jesus, there are certain things that don't go along with me. I got a huge, big, fat backpack, and I'm trying to climb in the narrow way. No, that's not going to go. So she has to surrender her allegiance to her family. She has to surrender her own freedom because if she takes on the yoke of service to the king, she's not going to be able to have the freedom to go and do anything else. But you know, it is glorious bondage when we take on the yoke of Christ because we're set in the lane of blessing and fruitfulness and fulfillment. I always like to say, is a train off its tracks really free, laying on its side, wheels spinning, going nowhere? Or is a train free on its tracks where it's free to fulfill its destiny at 100 miles an hour? Who's bound? We have people in the culture looking at us who follow Jesus saying, you're bound, you're weird, you're limited. Excuse me, we're train on the tracks going and fulfilling our destiny. You're laying sideways going nowhere with your wheels spinning and you're free and I'm bound. I think I'll stay bound <laughs> as a train on my little tracks. <laughs> And always remember, a critic is a dog barking at a passing train. Don't pay it any mind. Don't pay him any mind. A dog barking at a passing train. Isn't that lovely? You stay on your tracks, honey. Let everybody judge you. If you were free, you'd just jump off them tracks and be free with us. <laughs> yeah, right. Thank you. She gave up her family. She gave up her freedom and her friends, whatever association she had before she goes to David's palace. It's like, has God been parsing or removing people, places or things from your life? Has he been closing doors? Has he been putting the horse shutters and blinders on your eyes where you can't even look to the left or the right? Good news, Abishag. He is the one who's narrowing the lane of your life, Abishag and Shaggy. He's the one that has allowed you to live the life you've lived up until now that has made you so sensitive that you can be one of his precious midwives trusted in the birthing room and one of his Abishags trusted at the end of life. She was in charge of all the ADLs of David, the activities of daily life. This great king, Mr. Superstar of his time, is now 70 years old and can't do anything by himself. Now, I want you to notice this about her. She's committed to 
being everything the king needs 24-7. Did you know that's the surrender the Lord seeking in us? God doesn't need gold vessels. He doesn't need silver vessels. He needs yielded vessels. I'm not silver or gold. I'm not special. You don't need to be a yielded vessel. That's rare as hen's teeth in the church world. Do you see why Abishag is so rare that they had to look everywhere? Why? Because she's a rare combination of meal and oil and word and spirit and head and heart and beauty and character. Hello, it's as rare today as it was then. So the Holy Spirit is stirring up and waking up all of his Abishags and Shaggy, Shaggies. He's bringing forward all those midwives who are to be in the birthing room and the Abishags that are to be in the end of care, hospice. Because if you can be trusted at the beginning of life and at the end of life, you can be trusted with everything in between. Boy, Abishag is a unique little thing. And I want you to notice it says the king knew her not. This wasn't a sexual escapade. This wasn't something perverse. This was, don't call CPS on this story. This was, this was a common custom in the time of David, right? It takes a body to give warmth to another body. You can't be warm alone. And this young lady gives up her family. She gives up her freedom. She gives up her friends. And she's also surrendering her future. Everything about her life is going to go in the king's direction. She is going to be everything the king needs her to be. And beloved, did you know it's just as rare today to find men, women, boys, and girls, God's little Abishags that live only to serve him. They're flexible in every way. Lord, I'm one of those universal instruments. You can use me, one of those universal push buttons for your TV. It'll just sort of work everything. Lord, I don't want to just be a hammer. Too many of us just are hammers that God uses to pound nails. I want to, I want to be a tool belt for Jesus, that I'm a screwdriver and I'm a hammer and I'm a wrench and I'm anything he needs me to be. So I have access to full tools when it comes to head and heart and meal and oil, word and spirit. That's the spirit of Abishag. And it doesn't matter age, Shaggy and Abishag are not all 14. They're not all in their 20s. Whatever age you are right now, God is beginning to bring you forth to the king's palace. Your time of usability is now. Get excited. All of your life has been preparatory training for this season right now. God is searching for and he is bringing forth his precious Abishags. Surrenders the family, the freedom. And notice she surrenders her feelings. You know, Abishag, how do you feel? about being in the prime of life and being Miss Israel and the most gorgeous supermodel in the kingdom. And what's your destiny? To take care of a 70-year-old man and wipe his butt. Oh, this is a special girl. She surrenders her feelings. Did you know feelings follow decision? Well, I just don't feel in love anymore. Well, that's you, you're not doing anything you used to do initially when you felt in love. I remember the husband in Des Moines, Iowa, that loved his wife so much he almost told her. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? If you're not doing the things you did in the first blush of love, don't expect you're going to feel any feelings come and feelings go and feelings are deceiving. My warrant is the word of God. None else is worth believing. Feelings are fickle. She surrendered her feelings to the king. And the Bible says God gave her a cherishing, adoration, and love. And notice, Abishag has absolute access to the king. She is in the most favored position on earth in the planet. 
She is there. Bathsheba, his main squeeze, comes in to have meetings with him, and she bows down before him, and Abishag's just giving him a kiss on the cheek and feeding him some chocolate. Bathsheba doesn't even have the intimate access Abishag has. Is she using it for her own good? No. Is she feathering her own nest? No. Because she, she is eye-thouing the king, subject-to-subject relationship. She adores David as an end in and of himself. She's not eye-itting him, subject-object. She's not using David. Well, if I, if, I, if I take care of his stinky needs right now, then someday I'll be a billionaire. That's not Abishag. That's why she's there and none of his other wives are allowed in. He had plenty of women if he just needed a bed warmer. Where's Bathsheba, his main squeeze? Is she in here wiping his spit? No. She just comes in to ask for things. She comes in in this chapter and David says um, in Hebrew, he goes, what do you want? Because every time Bathsheba shows up, she wants something. What do you want? Abishag doesn't want anything. She loves the king. She adores David. Her feelings are subjected to her destiny, and she is everything the king needs her to be. What an idea. Do you know how uncommon it is for us to be blessed by someone else? Has anyone done anything good for you lately? Um, Stacy came back from Hawaii, and her and Mark were here, and they brought this beautiful lay and two weeks ago and put it around my neck and I preached with this lay. And I was so, it's so pretty. I didn't want to bother it. I didn't want to hurt it. I'm like, she's trying to put this on my neck and I'm saying, well, maybe we should just put it in the fridge. And, and I was resisting a blessing that Stacy was trying to put around my neck. She doesn't care if I bruised it or took it off and waved it in worship. It's mine for God's sake. And I'm thinking, Craig, you're 63 and you're still trepidatious about receiving good things from someone. Letting someone get in, you, they let you get in the parking space and you're like, no, no, you really can take it. God says, can you possibly say thank you and receive a gift? We're so unused to that. It's like, it's like we're suspicious when someone wants to be nice to us. What does he want? What is their motive? Abishag had no ulterior motives at all. She did not want anything from David except that every one of the king's needs were met and that she was the one that was sensitive to meet whatever need arose. I love his Abishags and his Shaggies. When you meet them, you know, they're radiant. They're incandescent. And did you see, we've talked before about the generation gap. Proverbs 20, 29 says, the glory of an old man is his, his white hair, and the glory of a young man is his strength, right? And we talk about the need for strength and wisdom, because if you just have wisdom and no strength, you talk all the time and get nothing done. But if you just have strength and no wisdom, young people destroy the world. So we need to yoke the strength of youth with the wisdom of old age. And what do we have in this palace room, in David's bedroom right here? We have strength and wisdom, all of it right there. Can you imagine the wisdom David has being the greatest king that's ever lived? Can you imagine the stories he was telling this precious young girl who was concerned to hear him? She wasn't just there on the clock going, yeah, tell me another story about uh, your other wives. And how tall was Goliath? She, she really wants to know. Imagine she was privy to the greatest secrets of David's heart. And guess what? As a midwife, as an end-of-life hospice worker, she was a great custodian of the secrets. She kept her mouth shut. Do you know what she's never recorded as speaking? She's always giving, serving, watching, cherishing and being everything the king needs 24 hours a day while all the other big meetings occur she's in every intimate meeting that happens in the bedroom when Bathsheba comes in when Nathan the prophet comes in when Benaiah the captain of the host comes in when Zadok the great priest come in she's privy to every oval office conversation going on at the center of empire why have you gone through everything you've gone through, Abishag and Shaggy? Because God needs to trust you with the confidences of his own heart. 
he needs to know that once you hear it, it's like a confession to a priest. It's forgotten. It's forgotten. She was privy to every secret meeting in David's bedroom. And while they're all meeting him formally, she is doting on him the whole time, probably fixing his hair up, or just doing so. They have their own unique relationship together, all rooted around the fact that David was old and got no heat. Amen. That's my favorite text in the Bible. And every day it's getting closer and closer. <laughs> Amen. And God bless every Abishag in the kingdom. Amen. Glory. Jesus, help me. You know, you know watch out. Watch out. He may be calling you. <laughs> she cherished the king. No one had ever loved David more than she. She has complete access to the king. Oh the true custodian of his secrets, his fears, his thoughts. She slept with him every night, warming him in a way he had never been warmed. David had known women all of his life, but he had never had a woman in his life like Abishag. And by the way, in our culture, Abishag is a really important image. If anyone is ever confused about their gender or confused about their sexuality or confused, Abishag is a patron saint. She's what we would call a eunuch for the kingdom. You know, Jesus did say there are some people who are eunuchs for the kingdom. That means they're not going to get married and they're not interested in sexual matters and they're, they, they just don't have a heart for it. That doesn't mean you're weird. It doesn't mean we have to invent new names to categorize you. You're an Abishag. You're a shaggy. That's all. You say, Craig, I don't like that eunuch. Did you? Well, okay, if you're not called to it, God has someone for you in due course. But if you happen to say, you know, I don't know where I fit and I just don't fit anywhere. Well, honey, if you don't fit where you are, chances are you're a pioneer. You're an Abishag. She didn't have any identity problems or, or confusions just because she is in love with David. She adores David and yet she has no sexual relationship with him. Abishag is a perfect model. Okay. I mean, sex is great. It's a gift from God. It's extremely possible, uh, uh, extremely powerful. It has to be treated with respect, but it isn't everything. I mean, things you want at 16, you're not that interested in at 63. I always say, I know I'm 63 because I would push Angelina Jolie off a French desk to see the fine grain in the desk. Look at this, Dennis. Look at this desk. <laughs> I'm only interested in collectibles now. So uh, you see me in the antique boutique and I'm, I'm hovering in over things. Your interests mature over time. And Abishags and Shaggies, there's no age indexical to who I'm talking about. They're all the 7,000 who haven't bought a need to bail nor kissed his mouth. They're all those who have been set aside. They've been hidden in hills and caves, and there are not a lot of them around. It's not like you can go, where do I find Abishag? Go to Abishag Barn. Go to Abishag Dating Online Apps, and you can just find a hundred of them. No, no, no. These are rare, safe people, rare combinations. But oh boy, I would have loved to eavesdropped in that palace and heard David's stories. You know, since I was a boy, I would interview great people, famous people, great historical figures, friends of historical figures, great philosophers, great theologians. And as a boy, I was doing a radio show and I would pick them out and I would go and find them. I knew JFK's secretary, Evelyn Lincoln. I knew his best friend, Paul Fay, uh, his best friend, Dave Powers. I sought out the people who knew the people that I loved and I would love to hear the tidbits and they would share them with me. I know what cologne President Kennedy wore. I know everything about these people from his friends. Oh, I would have loved to have been there with Shaq and David. Done a little podcast interview, just put a mic in there because she was safe enough for him to share all of his fears, all of his failures, all of his regrets, everything he needed to share just before he steps into eternity. And she was there when he died. Holy moment, holy moment. 
I wonder if you have any Abishags in your life or shaggy safe people that you would trust in the birthing room with you, that you would trust caring for you in hospice. Well, cheer up, beloved. God's search for his Abishags and Shaggies is going to be fulfilled and you're going to start seeing them pop up in the culture. Watch the culture. It's all chaos and loudness now, but you just watch as God's Renaissance Abishags start popping up. Extraordinarily gifted people that love him. And they're not just pretty or talented or sing well or smart, but they have moral character equal to what we see in Abishag. We see a marriage of beauty tenderness, safety, trustworthiness, everything you'd want if you chose them as a midwife or end-of-life caretaker. You say, Craig, is this the puzzle box you told me about? Yes, it's you. You look in the mirror and say, I am Abishag. I am Shaggy. You are. That's why you had to go through all the difficult things that have You've gone through a gym equal to the muscles you had to develop in your character. I'm sorry. It's been painful. But God, God has hurt you, but he's never harmed you. You have become everything you need to be right now so that you are worthy of the name Abishai. Doesn't matter where you came from. It's who you become in the process and the journey. And the Lord's very pleased with you right now, beloved. So you got a little bit of a name about yourself now. You've got all the notes. You go home, listen to it again, read through them all. Everything I said is right here for you. And we also have a sermon on the website called Midwives. You go listen to that one and mix those truths with this. It'll blow your mind. It talks about all the traits of midwives and talks about, are you a midwife for Jesus? Can he trust you with newness of life? Can he help you facilitate new life in others without intruding when you're in holy ground, but being an addition when you're in holy ground? You know, my dear friend Daniel Chu once said, he said, Craig Bethel is like an ER room. How many people get into an ER room? Ever been in ER? About two people. That you visit one at a time. Why? Because in a sacred theater of surgery, surgery where holy things are happening, you don't have a hundred people with dirty tennis shoes, coughing and spitting. Do you see? God wants to do holy things in the surgical theater he's calling you into, and that's why he's, he's made you this way. You've endured everything as a good soldier. And now you're going to start finding out why you went through everything you went through because you're going to start seeing all the fruits. Safety. You can be a confidant. He trusts you in intimate, holy moments. You're a good custodian of other people's secrets. You're safe in the surgical room, spiritually or otherwise, because you won't go and blab your mouth and tell everybody else's secrets. Congratulations, Abishag. You're right on time. Father, I thank you right now for all of your precious Abishags. Lord, thank you right now, Jesus. I just ask a blessing, God, upon all your precious head and heart, meal and oil, word and spirit servants. I thank you, Lord, for the sacrifices of each one listening, Lord, that has made them the person that can be trusted with the lives of others. I thank you that those that have had to say goodbye to their family, their freedom, their friends, their future, and to put all their tomorrows into your hand, God. And you are a great, faithful Father who will value the sacrifice of your Abishags, Lord, and they will live to see their hour of fruitfulness. They will serve the King, and if we will serve a dying King, how much more should we serve a living, resurrected Lord and King? in every day, in every way, Lord. Wherever you want us to go, we'll go. Whatever you want us to do, we'll do. However you want us to be, we'll be. Because we want to be everything that you need us to be in this time, in Jesus' name. Can you say amen? amen. Can you put your hands together and praise the Lord? Isn't he wonderful?
Abishai. You got a new name now, and now you got to study. And no, you will win friends and influence enemies by saying, no doubt you've heard the Abishai teaching. Who's that? Oh, you don't know who Abishai is. A biblical fool. Ah, thank God for me. Don't get proud on this now. You blow the whole thing. Come on up, brother. David is going to bring the table of the Lord. Now he's going to pass out a little bit of grape juice and a little wedge of a cracker. Okay. And if you don't understand this, this is called communion. It's called, it's nothing mystical or strange or weird to be frightened of. If you're uncomfortable with, you don't need to take it. But if you do, he's going to explain very simply what it is that we do as we go to the table of the Lord. And today we have a, a focus as we, as we take the, he'll explain the bread and he'll explain the blood and the meaning of it. And this becomes our point where we can open our hearts to just what you heard today. Anything you heard that really touched you today, this is an opportunity for us to surrender. To look in our hearts and go, Lord, is it family I need to surrender? Is it my freedom? Is it my friends? Is it my future? Is it my expectations? Is it my inability to find a spouse? Is it whatever you're, you're frantic about, whatever you're really hurt about, it's a good thing to make this moment, as David leads us, into that moment where we just surrender everything we are to him. Come on up, brother. Peace to you this morning. Amen. Peace. That's exactly what Jesus said to the disciples when he first revealed himself after he resurrected. And then he showed them his wounds. Isn't that cool? Viewing his wounds as we can meditate on that today produces peace. There were so many prophecies in the Old Testament that talked about the Messiah sacrificing his body, allowing it to be broken for ours to be physically healed. And that's what Jesus was talking about with the bread when he gave it. He said to break it and to, and to consume it. This was for your healing and wholeness. Let's partake. When you view and meditate on his wounds, which is exactly why I wore this shirt today, it also produces peace that all your sins are forgiven. He took the punishment for every sin you've ever committed and ever will commit on the cross. And that produces peace because now you have full acceptance by the Father because of the sacrifice of the Son. Isn't that beautiful? Receive his peace today as we consume Jesus did it all for us. Let's continue to celebrate his resurrection. It's the most incredible thing that's ever happened in the history of humanity. And we get to celebrate and be part of it by just saying yes. Don't have to do anything. Just say yes. Be at peace today, brothers and sisters. Hallelujah. Thank you. Bless his holy name. You know, things get so complicated that we forget that it's really easy to meet Jesus. It's not difficult. Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door of your heart, and I knock. And if you hear and you open the door, I will come in and have fellowship with you and you with me. But he's standing at the door, and the doorknob is on the inside. He, he doesn't force his way in. We must ask him. It's so simple. It's like, so I don't need to climb stairs on my knees and bleed and bells and smells and incense and nonsense and understand everything. No, no, no. All you need to do is open the door in the submarine underwater. That's sort of a simple thing to do, isn't it? <laughs> and you let the whole ocean in. That's all Jesus says. He doesn't say decide. He says surrender. You know, when I was a boy, my dad would have me run and jump into his arms in the swimming pool. And you know what? Never entered my mind he might drop me, and he never did. But I ran and left into his arms. It was an act of total surrender. That's all. He just says, open the door. Say yes. 
put your little hand up and go, I'd like whatever the man's talking about. I'd like to know Jesus too. I'd like to belong to Jesus. Okay. All right. That's all he asks is that you say yes in your heart. That's all. Yeah. You don't need to feel lightning. I remember in the new movie, The Chosen, by the way, if you want to see a movie about Jesus, watch The Chosen, three, three episodes. If you want to know about Jesus, watch The Chosen. It's all the rage on television right now. There's a scene where one of the apostles says, but I don't feel anything. And Jesus says, you don't need to feel anything to do great things for me. Feelings are nice, but well, I didn't feel lightning when I asked Jesus to come in, nor did I when I did that at 14, but in two weeks time, things began to change in my life. Something happened. So it's not about emotions. It's about you saying, come into my heart, Lord Jesus, have your way. I surrender to you. And he sees it. Nobody else needs to. He sees it. It's that simple. How do I know if I did it? Well, did you ask him? Just say, Jesus, come in. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. It's nobody's business. No one looking around for any reason. Maybe you would say, Craig, I, I, I would like to open my heart to Jesus. All right, well, let's do it right now. No time like the present. We just open our heart. Just imagine opening the door of your heart right now, all the way open, without fear, and just say, come into my heart, Lord Jesus. I give you my life. Be my Savior and my Lord. Forgive my sins. Make me your own. Amen. Open your eyes. Oh, but I didn't feel. You don't need to feel anything. Did you do it or not? Yeah, okay. Well, just watch. Your life is going to slowly start taking a different trajectory. Get, get your Bible and start reading the Gospel of John. Don't start in the Old Testament. You'll get lost and want to die. <laughs> I'm just warning you. Go to the New Testament, go to the Gospel of John, and read it five times through, beginning to end. Don't ask any questions. Read it five times through. And what I did is I read it through, and I just took a, a pencil, and I underlined any questions I had. As you're reading the chapters, if you don't understand something, underline and make write a question on a piece of paper. And then bring that to me, and I'll answer all the questions. Isn't that fun? Bring it to a Christian friend you know and say, I read the Gospel of John five times like the pastor told me to. I didn't understand most of it. Now I'm getting much more sense. But I do have some questions. Then hand those questions to them, and they'll answer them, and then you can go on. But start there and stay there for a while. You can't OD on the Gospel of John. You're not going to hurt yourself. Amen. Will the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord lift his countenance unto you and give you peace. Amen. In Jesus' name, we love you. We're here for you. If you just want to chit-chat, or I think we have some coffee back here. Boy, we, we do have a setup. See, they're, they're, they're rebuilding the whole hotel, and they gave us extra coffee. So you, are, you came on the right day. There's even a little cereal for the kids. For all the teen group in here. <laughs> We hope today's message has been a blessing to you. And if it has, please visit our website at drcraigjohnson.org. There you can find additional messages of encouragement. And if our ministry has been a blessing to you, please consider us in your ministry giving, as we depend solely on the financial assistance of our listeners like yourself. Also, please feel free to send any personal prayer requests. You can find us online at drcraigjohnson.org. God bless you.